Hello, my name is Jalen Avila, and in this video, we are going to discuss how to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy using your ultrasound. Your probe of choice here is going to be the phased array transducer. It's the cardiac transducer. So obviously this is the one that we're going to use. Now, our main findings for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HCM are going to be wall thickening and intraventricular obstruction. Now, there are some other things that can occur in the setting of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and this has to do with basically it not just being the walls. There's a lot of other things that can go on. It can mess with the actual architecture, the way that the muscle grows, and it's been associated with abnormalities around the valve itself, which can be prolonged cordae. You can have prolapse. You can have the papillary muscles insert directly into the mitral valve. So there's a lot of other things that can happen with somebody that has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but the big thing that we're going to look for is wall thickening and intraventricular obstruction to flow, specifically through the LVOT. What we're gonna look for here is we're gonna look, when we're actually measuring the thickness, is we're gonna look for wall thickening that is greater than 15 millimeters or greater or equal to 13 millimeters in patients in whom have relatives that are already diagnosed with HCM. And also we're looking for kind of focal thickening, not overall thickening, which could be a finding that you see in diastolic dysfunction or half pef So we want to see that there's a section that's more thick than a different section. And one of the ways that we can do this is looking at the intraventricular septum or IVS and posterior wall thickness ratio. And if that's greater than 1.3 in normotensive patients, that's diagnostic. And if it's greater than 1.5 in patients that have a history of hypertension, that's also diagnostic. Now, remember that this thickening can happen in a bunch of different variations, but it is generally focal thickening rather than thickening of the entire wall. I'm going to take a brief pause here just to let you know that all of our content is on the coreultrasound.com website. That is Ultrasound Podcast, 5 Minutes Sono, Ultrasound of the Week, Clip Bank, and we also have our courses page where we have the Core Ultrasound Fundamentals and Core Ultrasound Question Bank where you have 3,200 questions with feedback, including narrated videos explaining the question. Check it out and back to your video. So this is a patient here that has HCM. When we look at the septum right here, we can see that the septum is pretty thick relative to the posterior wall, which is what we're seeing here. And this is a patient with HCM. This is what it looks like. This wall is much thicker, the septal wall, than the posterior wall right here. Now, just to compare, here is what HCM looks like on the left side of the screen. Then on the right side of the screen, you can see what normal looks like. And you can see here that the wall on the HCM side, this side, this is much more thick relative to the normal side. And oftentimes, I'm not measuring every single patient's thickness. I'm just looking to see, I first look at it and see, Ooh, that looks kind of thick compared to what I'm used to seeing on a non thickened wall. But if you have any suspicion, you're going to want to measure it to make sure. So here's a patient with a bit of wall thickness here. Now this one I, is a little symmetric on both sides, but just to show you where you measure, you can do this on the parasternal long axis view, or you can do it on the parasternal short axis view. Just do it beneath the mitral valve itself. And you're going to want to measure it basically right here to get those ratios. Now, the issue with HCM is that it can cause this obstruction to outflow via the Venturi effect. So basically, whenever you have something narrowed and you have flow going through it, that's going to create increased velocity, which that increased velocity will suck the mitral valve leaflet kind of into it a little bit more, um, which can create even worse obstruction to outflow. And that's one of the things that we kind of think about it. But to be clear, this is not the only mechanism where patients can feel the symptoms or actually be harmed by this. There is also problems with electrical conduction through those kind of abnormal cardiac muscle fibers as well. 
Now, a way you can actually diagnose this systolic anterior motion is by looking at the cardiac cycle with a good parachannel long axis view, utilizing your M mode cursor. You're going to place it basically exactly where you would when you're measuring an EPSS to look for a systolic function. And remember with that M mode, you're measuring the in the x-axis, you're measuring the change in distance of things along that M-mode line over time, right? And so we know that this right here is the mitral valve moving around right here. And we know that when the mitral valve opens, that's diastole. And when it closes, we know that that's systole. Now, if we look up here, this is the septum right here. Just to orient you, this is a patient normal, right? This is normally a PSS, no systolic anterior motion. Now let's compare that to systolic anterior motion. We see this right here. This is that waveform. And then right here, we are seeing that mitral valve bump up again in systole. Cause remember this right here, when the valve is closed, the mitral valve, that's systole. And we should not see that mitral valve moving anteriorly during systole, it should be closed, not moving. It only should open during diastole. So over here we have normal, and then right here, just to remind you, we have HCM. We're seeing this anterior motion during systole of that mitral valve. This is how you would diagnose it. Another way that we can look for this is we can actually look for flow through that LVOT, what we would do is we would place continuous wave Doppler right through that LVOT using our apical five chamber view, and we're gonna identify the waveform. Now, what we should see is we should see as the flow is going away from us through the LVOT, you can see here that there's a brisk uptake and then a sort of slower kind of down tick of that velocity. But if you look on patients with obstruction, you're gonna have a little bit of a later peak. It's gonna kind of look like a shark fin. And that's how you can diagnose that using our continuous wave Doppler. Now, another thing that we can do also is we can look at the peak velocity here and use that to identify the LVOT gradient. Now, fortunately, if you look up top, you can see that it's already measured the PG or the peak gradient. And you can see here that it's pretty high, 170 millimeters of mercury in this patient. And if you have an LVOT gradient greater than 30, that's one of the ways that you can actually diagnose it. Now, if it's greater than 50, you can rest assured that it is more likely to be hemodynamically significant, but greater than 30 is a diagnostic criteria as well. So as a recap for how to diagnose HCM, we're gonna look for wall thickening and intraventricular obstruction, which is often how patients will present to you with findings of HCM. But remember, you can always have other things that you can see around that. And honestly, some of these other things like mitral valve abnormalities or diastolic dysfunction, for instance, this can actually clue you into the patient potentially having HCM as their diagnosis. That's it for this video. Please feel free to send me a message via any of these means if you want to know more information or review this video.